The comments and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not reflect those of their employers, friends, families, or casual acquaintances. This episode of Swim Talk A to B is sponsored by EddieReeseBook.com. The inspiring and enlightening book about legendary coach Eddie Reese would make a perfect holiday gift for any swimmer, coach, or swimming parent, or anyone else desiring to have a more meaningful and impactful life. Order now at EddieReeseBook.com. That's EddieReeseBook.com. Is that a great interview or Seriously, what? that's going to, that's going to, you're going to break that into two parts. Holy smokes. Hello and welcome to Swim Talk. I'm Dana Abbott, coming to you from the presentable city of Katy, Texas, on the disappearing western front of Houston, the Bayou City. And I'm delightfully joined by Swim Talk co-host and legendary coaching savant, Bob Button, comfortably sitting behind the golden microphone in a secure underground bunker about 70 miles distant in lovely Bay City, Texas. Bob, how's it going in Bay City this day? I tell you what, Dana, I have never been better. Thank you for asking. Our guest on Swim Talk this week is an old friend of mine. We started coaching together in Austin, Texas back in 1978 and have remained good friends and collaborators on some interesting written works over the years. Chuck Warner joins us today from Martinsville, New Jersey. Chuck, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Dana. Thanks, Bob. Good to be with you guys. Would you mind sharing with us your coaching path to get from where you started to where you are today? Boy, that could take our whole podcast, but uh, a quick uh, traveling nomad experiences out to college in California, uh, stayed there to coach the Redlands Swim Club and Redlands High School afterwards, um, really had a great experience of being in Southern California in the 70s when swimming, the swimming capital of the world, without any exaggeration, was Southern California. Um, from there, I had a call from Eddie Reese to go work with him at the University of Texas when he moved from Auburn to Texas. From there, I coached for a little while in Katy, Texas, and then went back home to Wilton, Connecticut, which is where I grew up, and um, took over the team from a friend of mine after a year or so and spent four years at Wilton, four years in Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Pepsi Marlins, about four years at the Sarasota Y in Sarasota, Florida, and then moved to college coaching at about 40 years old at Cal State Bakersfield, uh, four years there, and then to Rutgers University in New Jersey um, in 1997. And I stopped there in 2010 and opened a swim school and started running clinics and camps or continued to run camps um, for the last 10 years. That is the most brief concise condensation <laughs> that I've ever heard of your illustrious career to this point. You went through well, some really, really big time programs right there very quickly too, didn't he? Yeah, just on starting to unpack some boxes still. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Taking a while. Well, we're gonna talk a lot about books, so let me get started on the on the my first question about books, Chuck, was I'm interested in the timeline from concept to publication for the swim books that you've done. Uh, how long does it take to do all the research, organization, writing, editing, negotiating, et cetera? And did it vary from, from one of your works to the next a whole lot? Yeah, my first book idea was 1995. I was at the World University Games on the coaching staff and and thinking ahead to 96 and what terrible a terrible plight America was in with men's distance swimming. And I was taught, I made a new friend named Todd Kemmerling, who was coaching the distance men for the USA, and I was coaching the distance women. And so I, I had this idea that in 1976, um, Brian Goodell, Bob Hackett, um, Stephen Holland went 1502, 03, 04 in the 1500, and they were 16, 17, and 18 years old. 
And nobody in America had been able to do anything like that for the last 20 years. And I thought, I'm going to research this project and write a book about it. Because every time I go to Coaches Clinic, they're talking about we're not tough anymore. Kids are different. It's the relays and NCAs that are now short and all these reasons. So I thought I would dig into this. And Bob, I thought um, I, I have summers free in Bakersfield generally. So I figured in two months, three months, I could write this book. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, was I wrong. This was the kid from Redlands, University of Redlands that took one English class in college and got a D minus. And I credit that to the ladies in Tijuana the night before the big exam. But uh, I was never interested in writing particularly. But I just felt like this story had to be told. So after, I, I think we finally got that published um, in 2000. And actually in the um, fall of 1999, I sent the manuscript to Josh Stern, who was the um, <clears throat> coach of Eric Vent, who was America's best hope in distance swimming. And Josh told me he gave it to Eric in, at morning practice, and Eric put it on his desk in school, you know, behind his books all day long, and read the entire book during school that day. So it finally got published in about 2000. So that took five years from concept to the end. And the, the rest since then have been shorter. Um, and then they won gold, thinking about it for a few months, and then really devoting about five months, four months to just writing it. The Eddie Reese book was, um, <clears throat> I guess, about a year of research and writing intensely. But, you know, Dana and I have known Eddie for over 40 years since we coached with him. So really, the research goes back 40 years for that book. Right. Well, you kind of touched on my next question. It was, it was about how you choose your subject matter and, 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 you know, why the mile for the four champions. You just hit on it and i was wondering about the eight guys for and then they won gold how you how you settled on uh, that topic yeah and if i can say just a little more about the four champions reason um part of it was to tell that story but part of it was also that there was no michael phelps at the time that anybody knew about mm -hmm. there was no ryan lochte at the time that anybody knew about so if you think back in the late 90s we had no heroes in swimming and we had Michael Jordan in basketball and other athletes. But part, the secondary reason to write that book was to um, try to put, put an opportunity in front of kids that they could read a story about swimmers and have swimmers as heroes. And that might be a subject to come back to later. But staying on this subject of and then they won gold, um, that was actually an Eddie Reese idea of that there should be a recipe book for how to coach a backstroke or a freestyle or a butterflyer, and that we should look at it from, you know, what did Michael Phelps do when he was 8, 10, 12, 15 years old, and then won the gold medal. So right. that was really Eddie's idea that, um, that I took off from, and I really love that book. Um, it, I think it's got so much for age group coaches as well as parents, um, because all these guys were on a different timeline. You know, they were they all had their own route. Some like Lenny Kraselberg that completely quit swimming at 13 years old and then made a comeback, went to junior college and ended up, you know, being on the cover of of Reader's Digest for the 2000 Olympics and winning three gold medals. You know, just incredible the paths that people take to be really good. And then when I was finishing that book, my older brother said to me, the next book should be about Eddie Reese. And I commented to Eddie about that, about that time when I was interviewing him for that book. And he said, he laughed. He said, yeah, you and me will be the two that'll read it. <laughs> and, you know, it's hard to write swimming books because it's hard to hold anyone's attention or to have an audience, I guess, that's large enough to make it even worth um, the writing from a, from a financial standpoint. You know, there's not a lot of money to be made in it. But the Dana came love, up. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dana forwarded the idea to me that, I guess from Chris Kubik, about what about the wit and wisdom of Eddie Reese? And that really sounded fun. And so 
it took us, you know, well over a year, a year and a half about, I guess, from start to finish. Okay. Hey, it's almost like, it's, it's almost like you, you, you were reading my mind on these questions because, uh, my next question was I loved, and then they won gold. I'm reading it right now. And my question is any chance of a follow-up to that, like a women's version or another men's version? Yeah. The, the, the logic in writing that or, or in saying that it was volume one and there was going to be a volume two was, I started right in on the idea of a woman's book, and Mary T. Maher was willing to help. Tracy Hawkins was willing to help, and for you know guys as old as us, those are oh, big yeah. names. But huge, yeah. But the 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 what I was trying to do with Aaron Pearsall and Matt Biondi and Mike Berriman and Dave Burkoff and the people that were in the men's book was find people, swimmers that were still had times that were relevant. So their, their training would be relevant. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who wants to, to know how Johnny Weissmuller trained that doesn't help us very much today. <laughs> um, so flashing forward five, six years from, and then they won gold. I'm not sure who the woman would be, but I contacted one woman who was very successful swimmer and she said, well, how much am I going to get paid? <laughs> oh. said, well, well, you know, there's not a lot of money to be made about uh, from this, but I think part of the reason Matt Biondi was willing to help me and Aaron Pearsall wanted to be in the book and Josh Davis was a huge help in writing that book was to keep, to put their legacy down on paper somewhere for people to, to remember. And I got other, other people I had trouble getting a response from. And what I realized was that with the women, a lot of them already had books that they had written. And, you know, Elizabeth Beisel has a book and Missy Franklin right. has a book and Janet Evans has a book and Jenny Thompson has a book and Brooke Bennett probably has a book. Kim Rodenbaugh has a book. There's a lot of people, a lot of women that have written books, but I don't know, guys, maybe they can't or don't want to sit down and do it. So I'm kind of at a crossroads when it comes to the women's side of wanting, you know, would really need to get the right woman that would agree to do it. And I have a feeling Katie Ledecky is going to have a book and by all rights should. So right. Simone Manuel to, probably will too, right? Yeah. And not try to rewrite anybody's whole story, but I think it's neat to be able to read a short story. And then maybe that leads people into reading their whole story. So maybe we'll get there. I'm not sure. Well, I hope so. I really do. Uh, maybe, maybe they'll, uh, maybe someone will hear this and maybe they'll contact you about that. I really hope so. Hey, um, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I'm well known for that. Uh, I'm going to backtrack. It kind of, I always wanted to, to hear from the guys that were in the trenches here. Uh, give us a feel for what men's swimming was like back in the days of that old Southwest Conference. Things like everything from recruiting, dual meets, conference championships, all the way up through NCAAs. Now, that must have been a heck of a time because now that the Big 12 is really the Big 3 for men's swimming, uh, what was it like in the old Southwest Conference when just about every school uh, showed up uh, in force and, and they were rocking? These were, these were national caliber programs. You know, Dana's got a great story or two that hopefully he could share about that. Um, for, for us in, in going to Texas, SMU was the king of the hill. And both my brothers went to SMU. My older brother graduated in 1974 and was an All-American on the SMU team. And so I, I grew up with great respect for SMU and Coach McMillan and Coach Barr. And, and by the time Dana and I got to Texas and Eddie got to Texas, it was 1978 in the fall. But SMU was still on the top of the heap. And we were chasing those guys. And you know, Eddie, I, I, Bob, I had been a club coach and I was 23 years old, maybe. So I didn't really have a point of reference over what was good recruiting then. But um, <laughs> I'll tell you a short story and then maybe Dana has a longer one to tell you about uh, the SMU pool and and the adventure that he had there. But um, <laughs> but uh, we're on the pool deck one day at practice and and I, I hope Scott doesn't mind. Scott and Scott don't mind me telling this story. <laughs> I'll probably never hear it, right? Um, <laughs> but Eddie Reese has left the pool deck. And I couldn't understand a coach leaving the pool deck during practice, but he was making recruiting calls. And so one of the dynamics of 
of, um, you know, trying to build a program at Texas was dividing his time. And we didn't have a very good team when he walked in there. So um, we were really tough on our swimmers about turns and things like that. And, and, and Span was, Scott Span was one of the quickest turners and quickest swimmers in America. And, and Scott Hammond, Coach Hammond, was giving him a hard time about turning with two hands, which Span seldom did in practice. <laughs> and Scott Spann came in and raised his middle finger to Scott Hammond. <laughs> <laughs> Telling him he's number one. <laughs> Telling him he's number one. And Scott Hammond raced off the pool deck to tell Eddie that, uh, now this is probably, Scott's a great friend of mine. This is probably one of the low points of his life. But uh, t- tell Eddie that Spann just gave flipped him the bird. <laughs> and Eddie came stomping back on the pool deck. Um to tell Span he was kicked out of practice, not because he wanted to tell Span he was kicked out of practice, but he knew it was the right thing to back up his assistant coach. Um, so it was a little different. Eddie was hard at work at building a program and dealing with five assistant coaches that were um, all had their own personalities and their own way of doing things. Dana, should I be quiet? And do you have something to share? <laughs> well, we we have uh, I think the the best story about the transition or the passing of the baton or the torch from SMU to Texas was when we were standing on the deck at Texas uh, in 1979 at the Southwest Conference Championships, and SMU had won every Southwest Conference Championship since 1957. So they had come up with this cheer, which was nothing but a string of numbers. And they would yell out, 57, 58, 59, 60. And they just keep on going. And they got to uh, 78. And, you know, that was the end of the cheer. And I don't know they yelled, go SMU or, or go Mustangs. But, you know, that was the end of the cheer. And Eddie and Coach Mack were in close proximity to each other on the deck. And Eddie turned to Coach Mack and said, George, this has got to stop. And it did uh, the very uh, next year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sam Freeze was at Arkansas in, this, in the Big 12 in those days of the South, Southwest Conference and Coach Mack. There was some really good swimming in, in that conference. It's, it's too bad that it's dwindled and split up the way it has been. UH had a men's program with a heck of a sprinter. Yeah, uh, Phil Hansel. Yep. 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 Speaking of men's programs, you know, UH uh, went by the wayside. Uh, Rice went by the wayside. Nebraska, you know, when Rutgers dropped their men's program, you experienced firsthand the heartbreak. The coaches in several programs right now are going through. They've lost their men's and women's. Is there anything you took from that experience that that could help these these coaches uh, move on or – or maybe win their fight. I don't know what uh, it's, it's hard to imagine what they're going through. Uh, what can you tell them? Yeah. Yeah. When I, when we lost our men's program at Rutgers, I said to my older brother, um, as long as Madison Kennedy and Laura Wright stay, I, I guess I'll live with this. And Madison Kennedy's boyfriend transferred to Cal and Madison went with her and, and Laura Wright transferred to Maryland, or uh, Laura Wright's boyfriend transferred to Maryland, and Laura went with her. And I was just absolutely devastated. Mm. And now both of them are married to those guys, um, which is really wonderful. Um, I think, Bob, the, the real answer is probably what to do to keep those, those programs from getting dropped. And I think I, I've provided a few different people, all encompassing all points, how to go about it. You know, the problem, I think, is no one is paid to manage this situation. In other words, there's no one that wakes up every morning, sits down and says, how are we going to keep men swimming alive in America? Everybody reacts when it's over, and then we're full of energy and full of concentration on what to do. Yeah, no proactive... uh... Right. Work. Right. Rutgers put up such a fight that we ended up in the governor's office and we ended up having a conversation with the governor and the governor was going to do something about it. And then the next day he got in his car to go to uh, visit with Don Imus and the women's basketball team at Rutgers over 
um, some comments that Don Imus had made on his national radio show that got him fired from from MSNBC, I believe. Right. And Governor uh, Corzine had a near fatal car accident. And the last hope for men swimming at Rutgers went down the toilet right there. Mm. But I, I think what we really need is USA Swimming to be involved by keeping this out in front of everyone. I think we need club coaches to be involved by getting their swimmers to write to the state representatives and their governor's office to tell them how much they appreciate and admire and aspire to being a part of the University of Texas or SMU or whatever the swimming program is so that those people know that somebody is watching. I think we need college coaches to work on endowments. I think we need college coaches to um, be telling their freshmen when they come in that when they graduate, they're going to be in charge of helping keep the program alive. I, I think there's there's all this series of things that needs to be done, but there's no one that we're hiring to just do that job and right. really I, pay attention to it. I think we throw little, little pieces of... Uh, you know, mud at the wall once in a while and say that's our effort. And it's it's not. I think we if we could change, um, if Mothers Against Drunk Driving can change the way we look at drinking and driving, I think the American community could change how we look at college sports. Not that we're going to give up football, but that at least we're going to mirror to some degree the high school sports in our state at our state university. That's, Ooh, that's a great one right? because we have so many kids swimming, high school swimming in Texas, and there are so few opportunities, especially for the guys, uh, for them to stay in state. Yep. Now, when you when you mentioned uh, uh, endowing programs and working, I know we talked to Bill Wadley uh, with ASCA, and he is working toward that. And we've talked to a couple of our guests about endowing programs. And you and Dana teamed up with the hardcover version of your book, a.k.a. the Legacy Edition, to donate twenty five grand to UT. Uh, what's the specific name of the fund it went to in case any of these listeners, uh, uh, dozens of listeners, would like to contribute to that? Uh, can you tell us where, where that went to? Yeah, we, we contributed to the Eddie Reese um, Endowment, um, Scholarship Endowment, which is a part of the Longhorn Foundation at the University of Texas. And, um, you know, who would not think that the University of Te Texas would endow their men's swimming program? I mean, that is crazy not to think that would happen, but there's still a lot of money that needs to be um, contributed to be able to have that happen. Oh. And uh, so that that's a great question. And I hope it, I hope people that are listening will help do that. I think to, for anyone out there that might hear this and thinks, well, it'll never happen to Texas, <laughs> I would yeah. just have a big hearty laugh. When Rutgers was cut in men's swimming, I called my friend Bobby Hackett, um, who was in the book Four Champions, One Gold Medal, and he had his Harvard friends contributing to the Rutgers Fund because he said if they can do this to Rutgers, they can do it to Harvard. And yeah. if they can do it to Rutgers, they can do it to Texas. You know, Eddie can't coach forever and things are going to change. And even though an athletic director today, as great as they may be, has a point of view to keep programs, athletic directors change, too. So sure. we really need to be more self-sufficient. Who would have thought UCLA would dump their men? Who would have Absolutely. thought Miami would dump their men? And then, of course, later their women. You know, it, 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 yep. it's a, anywhere. Yep. Um, hey, Eddie Reese, Coaching, Swimming, Teaching Life is, is the book we're talking about. Uh, how'd you come up with that title? Uh, we went round and round and round. You know, we had all sorts of ideas. And uh, it's hard to come up with a good title. My brother came up with the title Four Champions, One Gold Medal, which I thought was a great way of encapsulating the entire story in in just a few words. And and I don't know that we have the perfect title for Eddie, but um, you know, we felt like there was really a combination of he's not just coaching swimming, he's really teaching and telling people how to live in a very quiet reserve way and um so that that was the point of the title was it's more than coaching swimming it's also about teaching life all right uh dana what what uh what are your thoughts 
Well, Chuck mentioned how he put five years into his first book, and I had the privilege of helping out a little bit uh, with, and then they won gold. I don't know what the total timeline on that was, but I do, <laughs> I do know the timeline on the Eddie Reese book. And Chuck worked burning the midnight oil during the daytime too. Sometimes we would we'd be on the phone. And I'd hear a, a blender going in the background because he was sitting down at Starbucks getting a couple of hours of writing done. And he was just prolific in churning out some really, really good passages for that book. And I took, you know, my computer with me. I was out in Utah while my, my family was taking a, a trip looking at Arches National Park and some other places. And I was down at the, the uh, Moab Library uh, doing research. And then uh, a couple of months later, I was over in Belgium uh, for a friend's uh, wedding anniversary, and I was working on the book. And Chuck was working on the book every day, and we we put an awful lot of time into this thing. And Chuck did the the uh, majority of of the writing. I just tell people, you know, I I mostly you know helped by drinking coffee and correcting spelling and punctuation. <laughs> So, so okay, I'm I'm going to backtrack a little bit. You know, we we talked to John Vogel a few episodes ago, and he was talking about his book, and he's probably found out what you guys found out. He's probably his timeline for his book is probably taking a whole lot longer, and I'm anxious to read it uh, when he gets it done. Team, uh, when he was with the Woodlands, uh, the powerhouse program that they had. So, listeners, we haven't forgotten about John. When we get word about the completion of that one, we will get the word out. Uh, but, yeah, he's probably running into what you guys ran into. It, it takes a lot longer than you would have thought. Yeah. It, it's, uh, you know, for me, it was um, – I think I missed two or three days out of a year when I didn't sit down and write uh, – work on the Eddie Reese book. And, um, you know, and, and I look back as we got toward the end and I – I said to somebody, maybe to Dana, that it's really a wonderful thing to be engrossed in the life of Eddie Reese every single day for two or four hours for a year. You know, Neat. it really was. It was just a privilege to kind of live there day in and day out and try to put on a piece of paper or in a computer um, a way of representing through the English language the kind of person that he is, the way that he coaches and and pull together these stories from from the guys on his team. I joke a lot about him stealing my stuff, but it's been the other way around. Everybody knows that. And uh, so many of us uh, coaches have taken so much from the man. And we use so many of the things that he's taught us, either in clinics or some of our swimmers have brought home uh, from his camp or his uh, program when they've swum for him. Uh, he's helped without ever physically being on our pool decks. He's helped so many programs around this country. Uh, it, it, you couldn't quantify it. No. And, and there's another way, I think, Bob, that, that Eddie helps everybody and all of us and the way he helped me. I got into coaching in part because I had a very dynamic coach that, that Dana met and we spent an evening <laughs> together. And Jim was a fabulous, fabulous coach, was the freshman coach at Yale, coached Don Scholander right after he won four Olympic gold medals in 1964. And what I saw was a guy that was organized and had a plan, but I also saw a guy that was very charismatic, that loved women besides his wife and loved alcohol of all kinds. <laughs> and when I went off to college, that was the biggest image of a coach that I had in my life. And then when I went to Texas, there was this different image. And it was a guy who loved his family, you know, absolutely loved the sport and everything about it, his swimmers, um, you know, technique, training. And instead of, hey, Chuck, do you want to go to the bar? It was, hey, Chuck, do you want to go for a run with Eleanor and I? And I think Eddie represents such a wholesome model that uh, Dana expressed it when we were writing the book, actually writing, and then they won gold, that it just kind of rubs off on the people that are around him. And when you're there with him every day of practice and his swimmers, you know, he, he tells them not to drink and all that, but he also demonstrates that and models that. So I think it's easier for them to 
um, to do what he does as opposed to just what he says. And that was one of the statements from one of the guys in the book, uh, one of his past formers, that they knew in the recruiting process there was other coaches that told them things and said certain things about the way to live and this and that and the other thing, but they knew that Eddie actually lived that way. And th that's just been really important to me and I think really important to coaches of, of having that kind of role model to aspire to be like. That's why kids will walk on there that have maybe been offered a full ride somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, the culture has just grown and grown over the years. When we were there, it wasn't like that at all, but it was, you could see that, you know, there was a gravitational force toward Eddie Reese and then over time it's become a monsoon. And I think the culture at Texas has changed tremendously over the last 42 years. The, the culture of the team members themselves, we had a wide variety and we had some people that uh, would kill themselves working and some not so much. But but now it, it's like every day they're racing each other in practice. They're, they're training harder than anybody has ever trained in the history of the sport. And it doesn't happen overnight. I think that's one lesson that a lot of young coaches need to take to heart. I remember when I left Texas after two years and came to take a struggling high school program here in Katy, I thought I could turn things around in three years, and uh, it took a lot longer than that. Uh, there, th there's a trickle down of uh, personalities and the the culture, and it takes a while to change it. And we definitely had some struggles when we were there. Chuck will remember well, but it's it's real different now. And right, not much, everybody much to when the you guys started. Yeah, not everybody when you guys started wanted to break down a wall for Eddie. Uh, I know that. <laughs> yeah. uh, but now that now most everybody in that program does or they're, or they're not going to be part of the program for long. Uh, it sounds like the mailman is here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That's all right. uh, and, and the hey, uh, the typical something typical. real current um, indoor pools without cases. We, we've got swim schools closed all over the place, especially in the north. Um, what can you tell us about the latest in New Jersey, Chuck? Uh, indoor pools being told not to be open. Yeah. Swimming World just published an article by us uh, that we contributed yesterday or the day before on this, this situation. And and we did a study when it went, in June when we um, were still closed and we saw tattoo parlors open, barbershops open. Um, I started making some phone calls to my old dropping Rutgers men's swimming friends. And we very quickly put together something called the New Jersey Swim Safety Alliance that was um, putting all swim schools, club coaches, high schools, trying to put everybody on the, together in a, the same organization to advocate for opening indoor pools. And we were able in just a couple of weeks to get somebody talking to the governor's chief of staff in New Jersey to tell him that this was a pretty safe proposition and much safer than taking the risk of kids drowning by not teaching them how to swim in July. So in New Jersey, we're open, but we're being proactive, again, learning from the dropping the men's situation, men's program situation of not sitting on our hands. So we recently did a study, 44 um, programs reporting in 212,000 people through their facilities and not a single case of COVID that was passed on or spread in any of those facilities. Nothing. And, and obviously, it's be, there's a number of reasons, but the main reason is the parents being very responsible about not coming in the door if they've been exposed. But for us, and I think most programs are like us, health screen when you walk in, temperature taken, background right. if you've been out of the area. And then we're wearing masks everywhere except when the kids are in the pool and and our instructors are wearing face shields. So knock on wood, we're doing pretty well with that. But Connecticut, a friend called me Friday night and he said we're being shut down for two months. And it started oh. on Monday. And he said, I just emailed my whole team who has a virtual meet this weekend. Everybody shave because right. we're not up in the water for it. two months. Um, and those guys are scrambling. And I think the lessons, I mean, COVID's different, but the lessons are similar 
with dropping college swimming programs and dropping men's swimming programs, college college programs, you can't wait and react. You've got to be out front and try to make sure people understand the value in what we're doing. So it, it's a struggle, but we're, we're open. And, you know, swim schools and swim programs in New Jersey are open. And I know in California, okay. we're still going. And, of course, Texas is generally doing well. But, uh, boy, we've got a few more months to get through this anyway. Yeah, yeah. so I, I didn't have that right. I, I was worried that you guys had been shut down. So you're still good in New Jersey. It's Connecticut because I remember seeing something on the, the swim coaches exchange that they were – uh, just what you were saying, they were they were fixing to shut down. They were going to run a virtual meet, and and they were done. But in Jersey, you're still okay. Jersey, we're okay. And Good. when this article came out in Swimming World, I noted how many people responded. And I think Oregon said they were shut down. I think Michigan said they were shut down. So boy, oh boy, um, I feel pretty lucky that we're still right. able to get through this. And we were closed from March to July, so. We, we've suffered as it is already. Yeah, I wanted to add, um, Chuck, you just said the responses you've gotten. This article just came out uh, yesterday on uh, the Swimming World website. And, you know, we all go to see what's playing on, on the storyline there. And you'll see uh, zero comments, two comments, three comments. I'm on it right now. There's 50 comments on this story. 50. Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I don't remember when I've seen 50 comments or even 20 comments on any story in recent times. And what uh, Bob just said, you were shut down for a long time, and it took a great struggle to get things open. We were shut down from the middle of March, about March 15th, till June, July 2nd. And, you know, it, it it's a matter of, and Dana, I'm not sure exactly what your question is, so I apologize if I'm answering a question you're not asking, but um, <laughs> it, what I learned in losing men's swimming at Rutgers was you've got to get a voice and you've got to get the right people to listen to you. It, you know, if you're right, you can't BS people, but we felt like we could function safely. So going back to uh, July or June, I started transcribing or looking at the transcri transcripts of all the, the governor's press conferences. And I, I wrote down the names of all the reporters that were asking him questions. And from there, I was able to get um, the email addresses of all these reporters. And I started contacting them and say, why aren't you guys asking about opening indoor pools? And that started a dialogue with those guys, and they started asking about why don't you open indoor pools. Very good. And, and so, you know, you, you're not, you don't have to be a victim if you can find a voice and find a way to contact people. And that was how we started. And then we secondarily, one of our leaders had an idea of doing a, a media blitz, meaning he said, you know, in marketing, you can do a little something over the period of a long time, or you can do a huge overload in a short time. So we got people together and we tried to accomplish a goal of a thousand uh, tweets and emails and Facebook posts to the governor's Facebook in about 24 or 48 hours to get his attention. And we did. And <laughs> putting all that together with reporters asking them questions they finally, the health department, I got on first name basis with them. And <laughs> the day our governor said he was changing his mind and closing indoor dining for the 4th of July weekend, which if you can imagine in New Jersey, two thirds of the shoreline or two thirds of the, the state line is shore. Um, the, the restaurants were furious right before the 4th of July, but he shut everything down. And then one of the reporters said, are you opening indoor pools? And he said, oh, no, we're not opening indoor pools. He didn't realize that we had already gotten to the Department of Health and his assistants. <laughs> and I got, a, I got an email from that reporter a half hour later saying, Chuck, I talked to his uh, so-and-so, his staff, and you're good to go. Um, All right. <laughs> and that night, the governor was tweeting out that, hey, indoor pools are open. <laughs> and now you see his Twitter feed filled with you are never getting reelected <laughs> to indoor dining on and on and on. And so I wrote back to our, our email list of 115 clubs and swim schools. I said, folks, the day is not over. 
Everybody say thank you. <laughs> Go on <laughs> now and yeah. say thank you on Twitter and on Facebook and every way you can, because when the governor wakes up tomorrow morning, he can't see all those negative comments. Right. And so we did. And, and last week, knowing how COVID is being more trouble, we sent our study to the Department of Health for the state of New Jersey. We sent another link around to the governor's office with a contact that we have there. We're just trying to be proactive because, you know, any of these guys, college presidents, um, governors, elected officials, they have large egos. They don't want to be embarrassed. And so once they announce the decision, getting them to announce a contrary decision is really hard to do. Oh, like, that. you know, we're going to cut swimming at William and Mary and then change their mind. That is tough. That is tough yeah. to pull off. Yeah. Hey, Dana, on that uh, swimming world uh, comment, that pile of comments yeah, uh, where they said there's zero cases on the indoor pools. I sure hope. I know what math has become in our country. I hope nobody has commented that there's even fewer outdoors. <laughs> I think I know someone who's already said that. <laughs> we have zero indoors a lot and like fewer you. <laughs> outdoors. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, keeping the kids out of the pools for training is one thing, but a lot of, a lot of programs, a lot of club programs, have uh, a, a counterpart to their competitive side. They run learn to swim programs and uh, like Swim America or, or something analogous to that. And swim lessons are a tremendous source of revenue, which allow uh, the competitive side of the club program to pay the coaches the salaries they deserve, to pay for the pool rentals, uh, to compensate for the expenses on the competitive side that are not met by training fees. And when you shut down the revenue stream from the, the learn to swim side, side right. it, it is a tremendous drain and has uh, probably caused the collapse of some programs. But I, I know our club program, we probably have equal numbers in competitive and learn to swim, maybe 600 of each. And we have, and, and our learn to swim stuff is taught in the high school pools and the high school pools are not letting anybody back in. So we're stuck with outdoor pools and uh, even in Texas, uh, outdoors this time of year, you're not going to be able to run, uh, learn to swim programs very well. Yeah, that's tough. Okay, Chuck, I know you're still running working clinics and camps and things, I'm, I'm assuming. And you've been in the business a while. I ask everybody this. Uh, many years ago, we, we would teach things that, that we don't teach anymore. And we brought some things in over the years that, that we wouldn't have taught years ago. Are there some things that you could call absolutes that, that we've been teaching for years, that we still are teaching, that we need to keep doing, uh, that you've noticed, Chuck? Um, you know, I don't feel like stroke technique has changed enormously since I was at the University of Texas with Eddie Reese. You know, and that's 40-plus years ago. It, uh, You know, Mike Murray had his four um, points the other day, which, right. you know, are, are, make a lot of sense and are very common. And, and when I do clinics and camps, I try to put every stroke into four words, you know, freestyle is stick your hand in freestyle is anchor or Mike's, you know, subluxing your shoulder joint or whatever. And then it's, um, rotate and then relax. And, relaxing being a really important part of every stroke cycle that sometimes coaches forget that when you lift your arm out of the water in freestyle, you want to relax. You want to get your elbow up. You want your hand to hang. Um, the stroke, of course, that's the hardest to relax in is butterfly because your kick finishes, your hands are out of the water. Nothing's propelling you go for, go to go forward. So you're essentially slowing down and then you've got to start all over again in the next stroke. If you look at it in a microcosm. So still trying to snap your hands and feet through enough to relax on that recovery. Right. Um, th those are some of the things that I think are, are important, but, um, you know, just simply paying attention to good stroke technique. When I came to Texas, I, I had the idea that um, my swimmers, if they were 12 years old, probably already had innate muscle memory to swimming a certain way. I shouldn't try to change them. And then I realized, holy cow, we're trying to change all these 18 or 20 year olds. I, <laughs> I, I just it was a whole different world. And so. I became pretty obsessed with trying to have as close to perfect technique with whomever I coached. And the basic idea that you're, you're not pulling water, you're pulling yourself down the pool, you're controlling water. 
and by controlling water and moving your body past your hands, that's what you're trying to head for. You're not trying to head for pulling water past you. Right. I think that resonates more with kids trying to come up with the words to explain, you know, in a way that it, it resonates with them. And I found that that description helps kids understand more the general goal is not just to pull water past them, but to move yourself down the pool. Set an anchor and, and pull yourself past that point. Exactly. Yep. Okay. I want to share something I, I heard on a TV show uh, recently. This is from a uh, well-recognized modern-day philosopher, and I think what he says right at the end is uh, really appropriate. But I want to share this uh, thinking about Eddie Reese. William Shakespeare said, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. No matter how an all-time great reaches the top, they all face the same question. When is the right time to pass on the crown? John Elway and Peyton Manning timed it pretty good. They both won championships and rode off into the sunset. But they were the exceptions. You don't want to limp out like a lamb. You want to still be roaring like a lion. And while it may be hard to know when to walk away from the thing that made you great, it's never the right time to be finished as a person. Life is a gift. Every day is a gift. And what you owe in return for it is to keep growing, keep learning, and keep getting better. And I thought about that last part about Eddie. You know, he's still roaring like a lion. Uh, his steps are a little bit slower, but not by much. But he still is growing. He is still learning. He is still getting better. And at some point, Chuck, you pointed out, you know, he can't coach forever. But isn't it amazing that he can still be getting better he's still gaining momentum at his profession yeah yeah it really is you know I, I a couple of years ago i went to see tony bennett 91 years old singing concert and i saw him 30 years ago probably maybe more in sarasota and 30 years ago when i saw him he put down his microphone at the end of the conference or the end of the concert and he sang fly me by the moon acapella with no microphone and filled the entire auditorium with his voice. When I saw him a couple of years ago, he did exactly the same thing at 91 years old. And it, I, I almost sent Eddie and Eleanor tickets to see Tony Bennett. <laughs> and so, you know, with a note, you're just a young pup. But you know, Eddie <laughs> loves, loves coaching and loves swimming so much. It's such a part of it, who he is that I think it's it's really hard for him to stop. And I think that quote, Dana, was was perfect in that if his swimmers, uh, Eddie's not going to be able to coach a fifth place team at NCAs. He's not going to be able to coach a team that doesn't have swimmers that have a chance at the Olympics. I just don't think that would be fun for him. But, <laughs> um, you know, I, I heard a podcast with him recently on Josh Davis's um, flimsy little audience compared to you guys, probably. But Eddie, Eddie, <laughs> <laughs> we wish. <laughs> Eddie was on there and, um, you know, as he said often, just wanting to still be effective. And if he's not, then it's going to be time to stop. And that he said, why Collins has done such a great job recruiting that that's why they keep getting these guys. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, Wyatt is propping him up. How do you not coach Carson Foster? How do you not coach Jake Foster? How do you not coach these guys? You know, I mean, what fun to see people that are faster than you've ever coached anybody to swim before. 335 and the 400 IM in October. You know, I mean, what fun. So I think Eddie gets so much joy out of seeing people go fast. As long as they keep going really fast, he'll probably try to keep going. But physical health um, withstanding, you know, right. he's, got to, he's got to be able to manage that. Well, he's always felt like he's been on the receiving end of so many blessings and he just wants to give back. Yeah. Just I don't know if, giving back. I don't know if you guys saw a uh, 60 Minutes on Sunday night, but they, a doctor there, a scientist said the babies that are born today will... 50% of them will live to be 103 years old. 
Mm. It's not amazing. Wow. Babies that are born today, 50% of them will live to be 103 years old. I saw a video of Eddie recently when I was doing some research for things that we might use to promote the book. And Eddie was being interviewed 12 years ago, I think, at the Texas pool. And he said, you know, if it wasn't for, for long swim meets, I think I could coach till about 109. <laughs> <laughs> so, putting those two things together, who knows how long this is going to go for. But right. um, it, it's great to see him still coaching. You know, it's going to be a sad day the day that he stops. Is there anything you wanted to throw out at us? We, we like to have our guests take us wherever they want. So if we've left anything out or if you want to, to mention anything, Chuck, it's a great time to, to throw it out there. Well, I'm so impressed with your, your podcast because you're innovators that I don't know of anybody that is actually put on podcast bloopers. And you guys apparently have several. But <laughs> Our entire episode podcast. sometimes a blooper. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thrilled to be a part of that. Um, I'll tell you one, one story before we get off, if you don't mind, which is no. – when I, when I wrote that first book, Four Champions, One Gold Medal, I was hoping that it would help kids and hope to give them heroes. And one of the things that happens in, in selling books is often you get emails from people that either are buying the book and then sometimes come back and, uh, and, and will <clears throat> follow up with an email. For example, Dana and I were in Austin a couple of years ago. Um, for a Longhorn event, foundation event, and there was a boy that was still in the pool swimming back and forth when the entire Texas team had finished practice. And I was so impressed that he was staying in there. And I went over to him and I said, that is impressive. And he said, I really had a bad year last year. And, and he, I, he introduced my, himself and I introduced myself and he said, I'm just trying to get it together again. And I realized he was a distance swimmer. And I said, I I think you need to read a book. And he said, four champions, one gold medal. And I said, yes. He said, I, I've read it four times. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was so great to hear that. But but here's my, my better story. And there's several of them. But um, I got an email from a mother excited about her daughter getting that book. And um, her daughter was a distance swimmer. And about six months later, a year later, two years later, whatever it was, I got another email from this mother. And she says, my daughter has been diagnosed with alopechu, which is hair loss, that she's going to become bald. And she said, I don't know how to, who else to talk to or who else to contact. But Stacy Anastitz it's, also yeah. has that d disease. And Stacy Anastitz was a great breaststroker. Oh, 2008 or so Olympic team, maybe something along that line, 2004. And she said, I'm trying to figure out a way to get a hold of Stacey Anna Stitz to, to boost my daughter's spirits. And I emailed to Terry McKeever, her college coach, Dave Salo, her club coach, on I think a Tuesday, because it was the week, I think, of women's NCAAs. And within a few hours, I got an email back from both of those guys. But thinking to myself that these guys are on the pool deck with their team at NCAs, but they're taking the time to email back because this little girl has just been diagnosed with a disease that's going to cause her to lose all her hair. And I, I asked them, I said, I need to get a hold of Stacey and Stitz and make this connection. And they said, she's in Egypt. Here's her email. I emailed to Egypt to Stacey and Stitz. You know, it, it wasn't 24 hours that she emailed back. She said, I'm all over it. I got it. I'll take care of it. And I guess the, the point of the story is, is partly, you know, it's wonderful to write books and to make connections, but what a small world of swimming this is and how well people can take care of each other by this simple world that we know what each other has gone through in terms of coaching and in terms of training as a swimmer. And uh, people like Dave Salo and Terry McKeever and Stacey Anastitz jump into that immediately and take care of that little girl is just really special. That is a great story that I've never heard before. Thank you so much for sharing that. I remember Stacey Anastitz came and talked to us at our NISCA conference one year. Uh -huh. and she was amazing. Absolutely yeah. amazing. A wonderful, wonderful woman. Yeah. Yeah. It's really a fraternity of 
men and women and swimmers and coaches. And thank you guys for doing this. I'm glad to be the 100,000th um, participant so far. And note that LeBron <laughs> James, Michael Jordan, and uh, <clears throat> who was it? Um, Barbara Streisand that were on your show recently. So it's really a privilege. Yeah, yeah we have that. really expanded into <laughs> <laughs> into the entertainment world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, just stay, uh, stay tuned. Cause we've got Abraham Lincoln coming up next week. Hey, no, seriously. We are so fortunate to be involved in the, the greatest sport. We really are. We're around the greatest people and, uh, I appreciate you being on Chuck. You're, you're one of the top and thank you for sharing all that stuff with us. This is, uh, this has been enjoyable. We may have to break this into two episodes, part one and part two, we had a lot in here and we took up a lot of your time, but thank you so much. Great pleasure, it's, Bob. As always, it's always fun talking with Chuck. When, when we do talk on the telephone, uh, I don't know we've ever had anything that was shorter than an hour or so. Uh, <laughs> it's just always good. I, I love listening to this guy. He's always thinking, always looking ahead and um, always caring. I think that, I don't know if you were like that before our time with Eddie, but uh you sure do care a lot about other people. So, you know, from one brother to another, thanks, Chuck. Thank you, Dana. All right, All you right. guys. Have a great day. Great thank you. You too, guys. everybody. Thanks for being with us. Okay. Bye bye. This episode of Swim Talk A to B has been sponsored by EddieReesBook.com. The inspiring and enlightening book about legendary coach Eddie Reese would make a perfect holiday gift for any swimmer, coach, or swimming parent, or anyone else desiring to have a more meaningful and impactful life. Order now at eddiereesbook.com. That's eddiereesbook.com. Thanks for joining us and voluntarily subjecting yourself to another episode of Swim Talk A to B, the podcast that doesn't bother trying to appear professional because we know you'd see right through that and ask for a refund. Join us next time as we explore the astonishing yet underwhelming depths of podcast mediocrity. We dare you. <laughs>